Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 you are going to hear a student who wants to buy a monthly mobile service plan. But first, you have some time to read questions 1 to 5. Now listen very carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi, how can I help you today? Uh, my phone plan's going to finish next month and I'm looking for a new contract. What kind do you want? Oh, I don't know. What are the options? Well, would you like just mobile or do you want one of our deals on mobile and home broadband services too? Just the mobile one, please. OK, sure. Well, we have some great mobile deals. We've got two offers at the moment. Are you a student? Yes, I am. Uh, then you probably want our student plan. OK. What does that include? Well, you get a new Sun 19 phone with the student plan. It's better than our other plans, which only give new customers a Sun 17 phone. We're offering that for a short period of time. Really? What's the minimum contract on that? Is that six or 12 months? Oh, it's 12. We never do six months. Ah, OK, sounds good. What else is in the plan? You probably get more minutes for calls than you need. There are limits on the number of calls you can make. Uh, let me see. That's 600. But with that, you also get unlimited texts. And most people use those more than calls these days. Hmm. And how much is that a month? It's £25. That's cheaper than the normal price to non-students. I'll have to think about it, I think. What about if I keep my old phone? Do you have a call-only plan? Yes, of course. And how much is that? Let's see. We'll need you to put down a deposit before you start the plan. So it's normally £10 after the second month. Although that depends on the amount of calls and data you use. For the first month, it's £15 and you'll get the extra £5 back when the contract comes to an end. And how many minutes do I get with that? You can make 400 minutes of calls a month on the basic call-only plan, but most of our customers only use about 200 of that limit. The basic one sounds perfect. Before you hear the rest of the recording, you have some time to read questions 6 to 10. Now listen very carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. Right, let me just take some details from you. Sure. What's your full name? David White. Like the colour? Yes, that's right. OK, and I need to take an email address just so we can contact you if there's a problem. Sure. It's Stegboy, that's S... T E G B O Y at studentuni.ac.uk. 
That's great. And we have your contact phone number. Now, how much data do you want? What kind of things do you use your phone for? Oh, I don't know. The usual, I guess. Uh, we have a five gigabyte plan, which we recommend for people who store games on their phone. It's also good for people with a lot of photos. Or we have a three gigabyte plan for more normal use. Do you use your phone for games regularly? Well, I don't game much, but I always have a lot of videos on there. I need to record things for my media course, so I think I'll go for the larger option. Sure, that's a good idea. And how would you prefer to pay? What are the options? We prefer our customers to send the money by automatic bank transfer. I'd prefer to do it by cash to start. I've just started at university and I haven't opened a bank account here yet. That's no problem. Just send us your bank account details when you have them. Or you can always do a monthly top up at any shop if you prefer. And where can I collect the card to get started? All you need to do is sign here and you can pick up your card at the reception desk, hmm. which you pass next to the entrance to the store. But first, you need to pay at the cash desk. Thanks. That's great. That is the end of part one. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to part two. You will hear a coordinator giving a speech to the volunteer workers before a race. Now you have some time to read questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Thank you all for volunteering to help us with the Windsor to Wokingham fun run. I'm sure with your contribution and some great teamwork, it'll be a huge success. The aim of this meeting is to give you all some information about your duties on the day of the race. Some of you were asking about where you can leave your car on the day. Well, unfortunately, most of the usual places around Windsor Great Park, for example, will be out of bounds on the day itself because we'll need extra space for the vehicles of the various emergency services. Probably the best option is the Bob Mills Sports Stadium in Wood Street. I know that the closest car park is actually at the Riversdale Shopping Centre, but I'd advise you to avoid that because they usually remove any cars that don't belong to their customers and it costs a lot to get your car back. At the starting point, most of you will be checking that the runners have all the necessary gear, especially their digital timing chip their race number and their identity wristband. Please make sure that the number is attached to the front of their t-shirt and not the back. The digital chip, which records the runner's time, needs to be clipped onto one of their shoes. And of course, check that they're wearing their wristband. Some of you will be in charge of organising the starting groups it's very important that runners start in a particular order and we have a system of colour codes for that. The yellow group are walkers and people with babies in pushchairs. The blue group 
are the runners that are expected to finish in under an hour, and the purple group are our top athletes. We'd like them to lead the race, and we'd like the other groups to follow after that, with the yellow group at the very back. This is for their own safety, really. Unfortunately, we're still short on volunteers for the race day. So, if you have any friends or family members who might be interested in helping out, please do let us know. We're probably okay for people to help with the start, but we still desperately need volunteers along the race course to distribute bottles of water to the runners. A few of you have offered to help with first aid, but actually, the lovely people of St John's Ambulance have donated their services for the day, so that won't be necessary. If you're stationed at the finish line, you'll be collecting the digital chips from the runners for us to send to headquarters. Now, this is a change from last year when we asked runners to put their chips in specially marked buckets. It's really important that participants don't go off home with the timing chips because then they won't know what their race time was. Before you hear the rest of the speech, you have some time to read questions 16 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. What else? Oh, yes. You'll get people coming to you to ask how they did in the race. We used to just post the results on the wall of the canteen in the old days, but we're just too big for that now, so we've had to change. We're looking at putting everything on our website in the future. But this year, all the race results will be published in the local newspaper on the 20th of May. There'll be a souvenir supplement with everyone's name, placings, times and lots of photos of the event. I'm sure lots of people will be setting themselves some goals and hopefully many will make their personal best on the day. There will be some catering on the day, but it will just be light snacks. No heavy food, obviously. And there'll be a selection of hot and cold drinks available too. The winners on the day will receive their medals on the stage that'll be set up just to the left of the information centre. On the day, the runners will be asked to put all their personal belongings in lockers at the community building on Rose Avenue. We used to ask runners to put their stuff in containers in the small building on Star Row, but the general feeling was that it's not convenient enough for everyone. And of course, you'll get lots of people asking you about the toilets. There will be two lots of toilets. The first will be behind the entrance at Pine Avenue and the other will be close to the start line on West Road. The last one will be the bigger of the two. I hope I haven't forgotten anything important and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to help after this meeting. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now let's go to part three. Part three. You will hear two students, Tom and Sarah, discussing an assignment on effects of music in hospitals.
Now you have some time to read questions 21 to 24. Now listen very carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi Tom, shall we start by looking at some of the older research done on hospital patients who look at art or listen to music? Yes, that would be useful. I think there's quite a lot of research, isn't there? There is. But I couldn't find many studies that produced strong evidence that looking at pictures or listening to music had any great medical value, like on a person's state of mind, for example. That's right. Most of the research seems to be based on art or music therapy in children's wards, and there wasn't much information about what happens with older people. I did see something on what effect it had on people who'd been injured very badly, but there wasn't a lot, really. The only other information is just based on what staff say they think the benefit of art is for patients. Did you read that report on the design of Hightown Hospital? That was really interesting. Yes, it's really modern. And the thing about this particular project is that they were able to include works of art in the design of the building at the very early stages. The funny thing was the staff attitude to the new building. In the beginning, their reaction was quite negative. I think it probably just took them time to get used to working in such a new and different environment, because after six months, most of them really liked it. It's strange because patients could see the benefits straight away. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to read questions 25 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 25 to 30. It was great that the researchers were able to assess the effect of art and music on patients and staff right from the start. And at least they were worried about the staff and so asked for their thoughts. And the staff were actually very grateful for that. Yes. The research on Hightown Hospital was the perfect opportunity to find out whether art and music can play a meaningful role in healthcare. What I thought was good about the research was how the researchers adapted the requirements of the study. This meant there weren't any major difficulties or extra work for the staff. And of course, staff and managers were more cooperative and supportive than they might have been. I know it took a lot longer than they had originally planned, but I guess it was worth it in the end. Yes, that was very important for the success of the project. But I think the patient questionnaire could have been designed more simply. There were too many questions, but... At least they focused on all the right areas, which is so important. Absolutely. The findings of the research were very interesting, weren't they? There were a few unexpected results. Yes, the impact on patients in some cases was quite clear. I've got the results here. The day surgery unit clinic was a good example. Yes, 
it really did make a difference there. As far as I remember, there was a huge drop in levels of anxiety in a significant number of patients, though they still needed the same amounts of medicine. And interestingly, it seems that the art was more effective than the music. That's right. And look at this, the children's unit. Well, the really noticeable thing here is that children left hospital on average a day earlier than children who had not been exposed to art and music. That's really significant, don't you think? Very interesting. Yes, I'd have expected children to respond better to music than art myself. Yes, me too. Let's look at the results from the accident and emergency unit. Well, the accident and emergency unit is the only part of the hospital in this study where exposing patients to art and music made no real difference to stress levels or the amount of medication required. I think it must be because patients don't spend as long here as they do in other parts of the hospital. Mm, you could be right. And finally, the ENT. You know, the ear, nose and throat unit. Well, here, patients responded more positively to music than the display of large, colourful paintings. I found that interesting, especially when we look at what's happened in other areas of the hospital. And another thing is that the staff were more cooperative too. Interesting. Well, the results are very exciting. And I think what we can use in our own research is maybe compare what we found here. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk about the Danish cultural concept called Huga. Before you listen, you have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Now listen very carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. And as part of your Danish language course, welcome to today's talk on the concept of Huga, which will help you understand a little more about the Danes and their culture. The basic idea of Huga is to make homes nicer, and people happier. But I go so far as to say that it's actually a whole attitude to life in Danish culture. So what is it exactly? Winter in Denmark is a long, cold season, with up to 17 hours of darkness a day between the months of October and March, and average temperatures around zero degrees Celsius. As a result of this, People spend more time indoors, and there's a greater focus on entertaining. The idea is to relax and feel as at home as possible, forgetting life's worries. Commonly, families and neighbours get together for a meal, with soft lighting or candles. Interestingly, more candles are used per head in Denmark than any other country in Europe. Huga could also be time spent on your own, curled up beneath a warm blanket 
watching a good film. It works best when there's not too large an empty space around the person or people. Nowadays, other people are starting to get used to the idea of hygge. Danish-themed restaurants have started to appear in many countries in Europe and even in America. Even if they haven't heard of hygge, they can still get a sense of it by visiting these Danish places, which feel very cosy and offer comforting food, such as traditional Danish cakes. Hygge is being exported, in fact, and the rest of the world now has the chance to learn what the Danish have known for generations. Books on the subject have also been published and can be bought from many websites as well as the usual high street outlets. The Danes are very aware that there doesn't need to be a strong relationship between wealth and well-being. They know that after our basic needs are met, having more money doesn't necessarily lead to more happiness. They are good at focusing on what brings them a better quality of life and at understanding that the best things in life are usually free, or at least needn't cost a fortune. Perhaps the tradition of hygge is part of the reason why Danish people are among the happiest in the world, at least according to research. The word hygge itself isn't actually a Danish one. It comes from a Norwegian word meaning well-being. It first appeared in Danish writing back in the 19th century and has changed over the years into the cultural idea known in Denmark in the 21st century. It's interesting that the word doesn't really translate into other languages. Not exactly, anyway. Hygge isn't limited to Denmark, so why is it so hard to describe without borrowing a Danish word? It sounds a bit like the English word hug, for which the Oxford English Dictionary lists no origins. And it's interesting to note that the effects of hygge and a hug are similar. They're both comforting and secure. We can put it another way and say that hygge is the absence in our lives of anything annoying. This allows us to enjoy the more gentle, calming things in life. Hygge is something that can be tried anywhere in the world, whenever anyone feels like it. But the difference is that in Denmark, it's a priority. It's a definite way of life. That is the end of part four. You now have some time to check your answers.